Uh, welcome everyone to um, what is the second science seminar series um, for 2022. Um, to begin, just a bit of brief housekeeping. Um, there will be time at the end of the seminar to ask questions, uh, but until then, if you could please remember to keep your microphones off. Um, that'll help uh, Dave be able to concentrate on his presentation. Um, if you do have any questions along the way, um, please feel free to type them into the Teams chat. Uh, and either you or I can return to them uh, during question time. Um, we also have quite a broad audience um, who attend these seminars, and so I'd like to repeat the uh, often stated, but I think still useful reminder um, that there's no such thing as a silly question, um, so please don't hold back. Any questions usually very welcome from the speaker's perspective. Uh, today, our presenter is Professor Dave Watson. Uh, and Dave is a professor of ecology at Charles Sturt University, where he leads a group of researchers working at the interface between community ecology and landscape scale restoration. Uh, Dave's current research encompasses topics such as sandalwood management in the Western desert um, through to wildlife conservation in agricultural landscapes. Um, recently, Dave has established the Australian Acoustic Observatory um, with a team of other researchers I hadn't actually heard about this until recently, um, but it looks absolutely fascinating. It's the world's first national acoustic observatory, and it has 400 solar powered sensors across Australia that record the sounds of wildlife and weather for 24 hours a day, and it's doing that for five years. Um, and this uh, acoustic data will be freely available to citizen scientists, researchers, artists, and the general public. Um, turning to the topic of today's seminar, um, Dave first discovered mistletoes and noticed their importance for woodland birds uh, during his honours research in the 90s. Um, so he has a long-standing interest in mistletoe ecology and its um, evolution worldwide. And he's recently discovered an undescribed species that has flowers 16 centimetres long in the highlands of Western Columbia. Um, so today, Dave is going to be presenting for us um, new insights into the ecology, evolution, and ecosystem-wide impacts of mistletoe. Thank you very much, Dave, and I'll hand it over to you. Miles, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that, uh, that very nice introduction. Uh, just switch over to, you don't need to see my email. There we go. How's that? Is that good? Looking good to me. Marvellous. Uh, so firstly, just like to acknowledge that I'm, uh, I'm dialing in from unceded Wiradjuri land, uh, and I acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present, uh, and emerging. So we're gonna have a bit of a chat about mistletoes. Uh, it'll be a wide ranging chat, um, and, uh, but hopefully there'll be enough to uh, tickle your fancy, and I'll be sure to build in plenty of time at the end for, for questions. I'd like to start with acknowledging um, funding sources, collaborators, um, and various entities for logistical support. I'm gonna be presenting about 25 years worth of research here in just over half an hour. So it's about a year per minute. Um, and you couldn't do that kind of work without a whole team behind you. So I'm just the Muppet here talking, uh, but please understand that there's an army uh, behind me without whom this, this wouldn't occur. Um, and as, as Chris mentioned at the outset there, um, Think of my research program as a, a rambling house, a big sort of decrepit mansion. Um, and the mistletoe business is sort of one room. Uh, there's many other rooms. Um, I do work in, in the neotropics. So I've got some, uh, some projects on the go with sandalwood and other root parasitic plants in WA. A lot of work on acoustics. Uh, Chris mentioned the acoustic observatory, which is actually really great because if I have a bad day, and I think we eh, didn't really do much today. I can still go to sleep at night knowing that I've got 400 machines out there collecting a gig of data a day. So it's, if for nothing else, it's good for a warm inner glow. Uh, and then the mistletoe side of things, we're gonna peer into that room, that room that is the mistletoe room, you're most definitely not gonna see all of it. It's tragic. There's an extensive collection of mistletoe themed ceramics. There's um, hand tools related to mistletoe harvest from, from Europe. Um, there's, there's the long, there's the, 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 the giant lipstick um, mistletoe from Columbia. Yeah, so we're just gonna have a bit, a bit of a glimpse um, and hopefully a bit of a lead in um, for, for things that you're, you're interested in finding out more about. Um, here's where we're gonna go. This is the mission. I'm gonna start just making sure we're on the same page um, about some basics, bust a few myths uh, and reinforce um, a few points that some of you may know about what mistletoes are, what they're not, where they came from. 
and how they get around. Uh, then pull back to my main focus uh, with research on parasitic plants, and that's their role in terms of affecting diversity. Uh, the idea that they function as a keystone, how they affect different uh, functional groups uh, of organisms, and then more broadly, um, the, the mechanisms underpinning um, those, those interactions. And then getting onto management, um, talking about can you have too much of a good thing, uh, or on the other side of the coin, if you don't have any mistletoes around, can you put it back? And we've been doing some of that in a few areas, including near you in mistletoe. And this, this journey reflects my own journey as a researcher, going from pattern noticing stuff to try to work out process and then doing experimentation and a whole lot of other work to really try to, to drill down and, and, and identify those mechanisms. Because mechanisms matter. Because if you know what's actually going on, that gives you, that defines a lever that you can then start to, to push and pull to, to achieve a desired um, applied outcome. Um, so for a lunchtime seminar, I figured I'm going to design this as a tasting platter. So get comfy. Um, it'll be moving uh, at, a, at a steady pace. Um, there'll be bits that may be of interest. So, you know, have a, have a proper serve. There'll be other bits that aren't really your cup of tea. So don't worry. It will move on to the next dish momentarily. So let's start by busting a few myths. Please don't feel bad if you think all these things are true. Many, many people do. Uh, these are all false. So let's go through them. Mistletoes, they're, they're, they're weeds, aren't they? Uh, and this is the P word, parasites. Mistletoes are parasites. And I think they get a lot of bad press because they're parasites. They're native plants. There's 1,500, I think it's actually more like 1,700 uh, species around the world. Um, and we've got almost 100 in Australia, 97 described. Uh, there's two that we know of that haven't been described yet. So even numbers, 100 mistletoes, most of which 70 odd are endemic uh, to Australia, all native, none introduced. Toxic, little Johnny, you know, got into the mistletoe bush. Is he gonna die? Johnny's gonna be fine. Uh, they're good tucker. Uh, many, many things eat them. Uh, indigenous Australians have been snacking on mistletoe for a very long time. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, and we'll, we'll revisit that later on, widely consumed. Now the killing trees business, I, uh, I get, many messages a week about this um, and they don't necessarily kill trees if they did that would be kind of a dud evolutionary strategy they necessarily take from their hosts that's how they make their, a living but um, it's more to do with effects on on vigor uh, than on mortality um, and some work we've done uh, demonstrates that uh, most of the mistletoes you see are growing on trees that have resources to spare uh, spare water in most cases, spare nutrients in some cases. Uh, if they land on a tree that's struggling, um, there just isn't enough to go around for that mistletoe to penetrate, establish, and then grow to maturity, uh, with some exceptions. And then the, the infesting, I love this verb, shark infested waters. Um, mistletoes don't infest, they're parasites, they infect, they infect. Um, and yeah, as I said, there's a host quality issue going on there. So when you see a tree full of mistletoes, that's not telling you that's crook tree. Uh, that's telling you that tree's got a lot of resources spare and the factors that would normally control mistletoe aren't operating. So dial down those nutrients, potentially, uh, dial up those, um, those controlling mechanisms, typically natural enemies, um, and you'll be back in, back in balance. Uh, and a reminder, I mean, look at that thing. That's fleshy mistletoe, that's an epiparasitic mistletoe, a mistletoe that preferentially grows on other mistletoes. Gorgeous native plants. When you think of native plants in Australia, you might think of proteaceae, you might think of got some pretty cool orchids. Um, we've also got a radiation of some specky mistletoes from three different families um, and uh, yeah, worth celebrating. And if you wanna know more, if I've just sort of piqued your interest here, get the book, it's all in there. So let's dive in. Firstly, mistletoes, what are we talking about here? They're not one thing, okay? For the evolutionary minded uh, folk in the audience, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, mistletoes are not monophyletic. They are not one group, they're five groups. They're a functional group. Five different families, not each other's closest relatives, all derived from root parasitic ancestors, all independently uh, acquired the aerial parasitic habit. And that's three things that make a mistletoe a mistletoe. They do their infecting up in the canopy, aerial, they're woody, uh, and, uh, and they're parasitic. Uh, in, this, in almost all cases, hemiparasitic, so they're green plants that take uh, water and dissolve nutrients from their, from their host. Um, 
So let's just have a little look here at uh, the family tree of mistletoes. This is within the Santalales, a group that's been around for a very long time, way back to the Cretaceous. Uh, purple here is root parasitic, so it's color coded. Um, the, the, the ancestor way back, black, was an autotrophic plant, a regular plant that made its own sugars and acquired its own nutrients with the, with the root system in the soil. At some point, way back uh, in the Santalales, they became predominantly root parasitic. The purple lineage is there. Five of them, uh, the Viscaceae, uh, a group within the Santalaceae, the Lorantaceae, Mesodendronaceae, and a weird group that's now a family of them, the Amphorogynaceae, they are the mistletoes. Uh, and if you look, this is, this is uh, relatively recent phylogenetic work uh, by Barrett and Liu and, and Nick Rent. Uh, using time calibrated nodes from fossils, uh, as well as um, uh, decay rates from uh, a couple of genes. We've got dates on when those root parasitic plants climbed into the canopy. And we've got an interesting conundrum. The mistletoes predate birds. There were mistletoes in proto trees, in the canopy, in the Paleocene, before dinosaurs started flapping around. So it's like, huh. So all those critters that move mistletoes around in Australia and elsewhere in the world, both their pollen, so nectarivorous species that pollinate mistletoes, like the sword hummingbird here, uh, and frugivores, uh, like these flower peckers in the Philippines that move the fruit around, they weren't around when these transitions occurred from root parasitic understory shrub to aerially parasitic canopy duva. Instead, mammals did the job. There's a couple of mammals that still do. A weird marsupial, sole living member of the order Microbiotheria, the Monita del Monte, a little, it's a bit like a pygmy possum, it's a marsupial uh, in Chile um, and, uh, and the Southern Andes. There's the mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs, Caragalidae in, uh, in Madagascar, especially in Western Madagascar, they are the sole dispersers of mistletoe. And I'm presuming that before these lineages of birds popped up in the Oligocene Miocene that now do the job, all these mammals appeared right at the time that that transition to aerial uh, parasitism occurred. The idea being that these early primates, these early marsupials, they were the agents, not just of initial dispersal, but of first dispersal. They took the fruits from some scungy root parasitic understory shrub and plopped it up in the canopy and probably through an intermediate uh, morph that parasitized epiphytes. So there's roots already up there. Uh, that's how mistletoes were first born, independently in the Viscaceae, mediated by an early primate, and the Lorantaceae, mediated by an early um, uh, microbiotherian marsupial in Western Gondwana, and probably the same taxa with these other two lineages, but we don't know much about them. This one, the Mesodendronaceae, that's a different critter altogether. That's a Nothophagus specific uh, wind dispersed dude. So that's that, that's different. Uh, so we need to rethink um, a few things about, about the bird mistletoe arrangement. It's a relatively, in, 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 the, in the fossil record sense, it's a relatively recent association, but it's been a long standing association. And these are the ones that have captured people's attention the most. Uh, these are the representatives of the lineages of birds called mistletoe specialist frugivores. Pretty much all they eat is mistletoe, all they feed their chicks is mistletoe. And so because of that dietary importance, they've been presumed to be the ecologically important mistletoe dispersers. Uh, my personal favorite is the yellow crowned terenulate photographed here in Panama. Not only does it eat the mistletoes, not only does it feed mistletoe fruit to its chicks, it makes its nest from regurgitated mistletoe seeds. So that's a commitment that I applaud. Uh, so let's look at, at this in a bit more detail. Um, this has been published for a little while, so I'll zip through it. Interested people may well be familiar with this story. To really see the role that mistletoe specialist frugivores play, we wanted to go to a pretty simple system. So we went to inland Australia, vast car park at uh, landscape with little drainage lines uh, where there's two kinds of plants, hosts and parasites. In this case, mistletoe and sandalwood. The mistletoe in question is Amoeba, um, which one is that? Amoeba pricio. Uh, and we did a very simple study where, where a single data point would have been a, a, a smoking gun. We put acoustic recorders in places where there was plenty of mistletoe and acoustic, acoustic recorders in places where there was no mistletoe and asked a simple question. Do specialist frugivores take mistletoe into new areas? 
Is there any evidence that a mistletoe bird appears, calls, defecates in a little stand of acacia potential hosts and there's no mistletoe there before? Are these specialist frugivores agents of mistletoe colonization? And we didn't find any evidence of that. We did various tests of this in several ways. The only mistletoe record, mistletoe bird records we, we recorded from both defecated seeds uh, and from uh, vocalizations recorded was in places where there was plenty of mistletoe already. So it's like, huh, and that makes sense. That's all these little dudes eat. All they eat is mistletoe fruit. So they've really got no business going to these uninfected stands because there's nothing for them. The cupboard is bare. Um, so who else is moving it around? Who could be uh, initiating these, 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 these new, um, uh, you know, subpopulations of mistletoe? Who could be moving it to uninfected areas? There's a few options. Most of them honey eaters, which are an ancient lineage um, of Australasian birds. And sure enough, we found with radio tracking, the blue there is the extent of mistletoe on a roadside stand around parks. Those are traces of radio track birds that were trapped around the mistletoe. They were feeding actively on mistletoe and we followed them around and they went well beyond where mistletoe occurred up to almost a kilometre within the gut passage rate it takes for a seed to go in one end of a honey eater and out the other. 35 to 45 minutes for a spiny cheeked honey eater as opposed to 14 minutes for a mistletoe bird. So pulling right back from Australia, pulling right back from even birds, we looked at this on a global scale. The gray there is the distributional extent of all mistletoes. The black is the extent of these mistletoe specialist frugivores. So while mistletoe specialist frugivores necessarily need mistletoe, that is their sole or at least principal food source, the reverse doesn't hold. There are plenty of parts of the world, most of North America, all of Europe, significant chunks of Southern Africa, Southern South America, and most island communities where there's heaps of mistletoe, there are no specialist frugivores there. Thank you very much. So rather than seeing these specialists as a co-evolved, you know, mutualist, hand in hand with the mistletoe walking off into the sunset, which textbooks still suggest, we suggest it's actually more of a, a um, an exploitative relationship that the generalists, the things like these guys that eat many other things as part of a much broader diet, including many other fruits, many other insects, they're the dudes that take mistletoe further afield, including to islands, setting a very well laid table for these specialists to then take advantage of and set up territories, defending territories, excluding these good guys. So there's an interesting co-evolutionary story there about the disproportionate importance of generalists. We love focusing on specialists, but I think in this case, generalists really are the ones that are calling the shots. Um, so that's that's the paper there um, in Ecologia. Well worth following up if you're interested in these ideas. And there's some we cite some other papers in other systems that have found generalists to be surprisingly important in explaining what's going on both in evolutionary terms and in current ecological terms in terms of uh, ma maintaining these interactions. So this is a, a telling photograph. Uh, that's a coughed up pellet from a, a little crow in the Streslecki Desert, full of mistletoe fruit. Now that literally fell on stony ground. So no mistletoes are gonna come out of that interaction, but that's the sort of rare event that would have taken mistletoes to new territory. Uh, uninfected hosts, new distributional um, you know, outliers, uh, either on a mainland or in, a, in an insular system. So that's a little bit to get you going about seed dispersal, how mistletoes come to be. Now let's look about, let's talk about um, diversity and the effects that mistletoe has on diversity. Keystones, I'm assuming many of you know about keystones. In case you don't, uh, a good example is the second largest bird. Why? Well, in terms of mass, well, anyway, a bloody big bird in Australia, northern cassowary, one of three living cassowaries. Um, big bird, large mouth, also quite a large bum. They're the only bird that can, they're the only animal that can disperse intact seeds of, of quite a range of large seeded rainforest plants, including canopy emergence trees in parts of New Guinea and Cape York. So you go to the Daintree rainforest, there might be 340 species of bird in that forest. Only one of them can move those big seeded trees around. And it does that quite effectively, moves it away from the parent tree in a nice package of pre-mixed fertilizer. Sometimes those packages are deposited in canopy gaps, plenty of light, up she goes, 
and hey presto, you've got you've got a, a Davidson's plum or, or whatever it is. So take one crappy little honey eater out of the Dane tree, not much happens. Take a northern cassowary out of the Dane tree, you're no longer getting recruitment for a subset of your canopy trees. And so the forest will start losing diversity as the, all the species associated with those trees peter out as those trees are no longer regenerating. So that's the idea of keystone. Just one critter, just one species, but it punches well, well, well above its weight. So the idea being that mistletoe may act as an ecological keystone, we tested this. We tested this with a large scale experiment uh, just up the road from where I'm calling you, um, uh, around uh, the Billabong Creek catchment on the road between Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, on private land, grassy box woodland, we removed every mistletoe from 20 woodland sites. So there's mistletoe, Oop, it's gone. One more time, there's mistletoe, Oop, it's gone. So we did that 38,000 times, largest uh, experiment to do with ecological keystones ever undertaken. Um, and we found a really clear cut effect. Within three years of taking mistletoe away from some sites and doing nothing with other sites and then removing the equivalent amount of eucalypt branches from, from the, the, the control sites, we lost a third of our birds. That's all birds. That's ibis, that's ducks, that's raptors, swallows. We lost a third of our birds in the sites where we took mistletoe away. The control sites diversity actually went up. Um, so direct role uh, as a keystone was confirmed. There's various numbers that ecologists use to see, you know, my keystone's a better keystone than yours, the keystone index, keystoneness, oh, terrible word. Um, and so killer whales have a keystone index of 11. That is to say that their effect on diversity is 11 times what you would expect based on their biomass. Mistletoe has a keystone index of 174 for woodland dependent birds. So you always knew in your heart of hearts that hooded robins were better than killer whales. Now the numbers back you up. But weirdly, when we had a look at it, it wasn't the guys that we were expecting. It wasn't the birds that nest in mistletoe. It wasn't the birds that feed on mistletoe. Um, so there was obviously more work to be done. So while news was breaking, while everyone was excited about this, we were still scratching our heads going, no, nah, there's more to this. We're, we're not done yet. So that big experiment was done, but then we needed to do some follow-up work, some more analyses and really dig deeper to find out what was driving this pretty clear, um, you know, community scale pattern. So here's the numbers uh, graph for you. So this is, this is the, the numbers I shared. So, so blue is take mistletoe away, they're the treatment sites. Uh, red is leave the mistletoe alone, the control sites. And there's the, the difference, losing a third of your birds three years after taking mistletoe away. That pattern is driven exclusively by insect eating birds. This big arrow here, they went from, uh, they just crashed. Uh, take them away and look at everything else. There is no statistical difference, no meaningful difference between the control and treatment sites. It's all about insectivores, primarily ground foraging insectivores. Now we know a little bit about ground foraging insectivores, but ecologists use another word for them. They call them declining woodland birds. They're not doing very well. Their ranges are shrinking inland. They're becoming less abundant. They're not breeding as well as they used to. They're in trouble. And could it be that, um, that that's indicative of this mechanism we're chasing? Could it be to do with insects? Could it be to do with insects on the ground? Could it be to do with leaf litter that these insects are reliant upon? So I needed to take off my bird hat, put that to one side and put on my insect hat and really embrace how do these woodlands work? from an arthropods, uh, a litter dwelling arthropods point of view. Lot of data there, a few things matter. This is to remind you that not all insects are equally tasty uh, for your average ground foraging insectivore, your babbler, your, your um, white wing chuff or your brown tree creeper. There's a subset of arthropods that are favored. Beetles, caterpillars, um, spiders especially, and, uh, and grasshoppers. That's what it's all about. Many other things are just simply not eaten or not eaten very much at all. That's what declining woodlands prefer. That's what's got the higher micro and macronutrients in the first uh, comparison ever done of those, of those groups as bird food. So we did some more experimentation. We mucked around with mistletoe in bags, put mistletoe and eucalypt litter under some trees, just eucalypt litter under other ones, uh, did pitfall trapping, and looked at colonization rates of insects. 
and found a lot more insects in areas where we had put mistletoe litter. Uh, so it's quite a dynamic thing. So once you scale that up and look at, okay, if you've got sort of 10 mistletoes to the hectare, how much litter does that generate? What's, what, 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 what's the effective area of that? And we found this many more insects per, per square meter. Add 10 mistletoes to a grassy box woodland, you get two and a half million more insects per year. Insects that you know these declining birds eat. So that's a big deal. Uh, if you're in the conservation management business, um, the, 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 the turn on more food lever is a lever that you want to know about. And mistletoes would appear to be one of those levers. Um, just another way to depict uh, that information. The differences uh, with where there was mistletoe litter or not litter was quite stark in some groups. Not all of them, tasties. So, you know, millipedes really responded well. I don't, I'm, I don't know of any birds that eat millipedes in Australia. A few Amazonian ones do. Um, but yeah, a lot of the things that we were interested in, uh, the, the things that we know birds are depending on, especially depending on when they're feeding chicks. So, you know, this has demographic um, importance. Quite a, quite a major effect size there um, with mistletoe litter being the, being the driver. Uh, and so this ties in with what we know about mistletoe litter. It's good stuff. There's a lot of it and it's enriched. The way mistletoe keeps drawing moisture from its host is it retains cations in its tissues. So it's got very high concentrations of potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, sometimes more in real terms in the mistletoe in the canopy than in the entire host uh, above and below ground. And so that could be driving some of the patterns we're seeing. This acquisition, concentration uh, of, of nutrients, and then as it, as it falls, uh, a lens of quite uh, fertile uh, humus uh, beneath beneath infected hosts, driving uh, this this large this, this heterogeneity in in um, in epigeic arthropods. This is by no means an Australia only uh, finding. This is by no means a mistletoe only finding. I have colleagues in Zimbabwe in monsoonal forests dominated by acacias. In Spain in coniferous forests where there's a couple of mistletoe, where there's one mistletoe, and in northern uh, Scandinavia where there's root parasitic herbs. Same pattern. Add parasitic plants, get more litter, get more enrichment, uh, higher decomposition rates, more bugs. Uh, but so far, um, no equivalent data on insectivores, but, um, but some tempting data from the, from the Spain system. Now, the best equivalent I can give you in terms of, of, a, of a contorted mechanistic story driving a pretty obvious pattern comes from uh, the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, Oregon, uh, up into British Columbia there on the uh, Canadian-US border. Here's a western red cedar in a stand of, of young Douglas firs. And this is a prized tree. First Nations and, uh, and invaders both love these trees. They're, they're glorious timber. Uh, the cabinet behind me was made from some of this timber. Um, and foresters, I think, from talking with, with First Nations uh, people originally, had this understanding that the Western Red Seed is growing in near creeks uh, that, 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 led to the, that led to the ocean. Uh, so ocean going watersheds had much faster growing uh, cedars though. They were favored. If you're in an inland catchment, the trees were there, but they were small and scrappy. And it's like, wow, that's a, that's a cute story. That, that's, that, that's, that's nice. But um, some, some ecologists at University of Washington actually looked at this, tested and found more blow me down. It actually is the case. And they did a lot of det detective work and found out the reason why you've got these accelerated growth rates of this species of tree in catchments leading to the sea. Bear with me, is because bears are messy eaters. Brown bears are messy eaters. Catchments that go to the sea, have an adramus salmon that that uh, that leave and then come back to those um, uh, watersheds full of marine derived goodies uh, to spawn and in most cases die. Uh, bears know this; they gravitate towards these creek lines when the salmon are heading back up uh, to the upper catchment. Grab them, drag them into the forest, eat the tasty bits, the heads, the bellies, the eggs, and then go back and get another one. 
Uh, state of isotope work um, can distinguish marine derived nitrogen quite nicely from terrestrially derived nitrogen. About on average 71% of the nitrogen in Western red cedars is marine derived. So it might seem a really tiny wrinkle in food webs. It would be just one little wiggly line of you know salmon to dirt to insects to fungi to tree. But that's actually what's driving these wacky growth rates um, of this one in this one system. And the other thing I want to take you to take away from this is patchiness. This is not uniform. With missiles, back to mistletoe here. This is some work I've done with colleagues in the Pacific Northwest uh, with a canopy crane, looking at dwarf mistletoes and how they are distributed through a forest. It's not the occasional tree has mistletoe. Some trees have a lot, most trees have none, and those trees that have a lot are clustered spatially. So go back to the litter data, that tells you that you're getting these lenses of super duper litter interspersed in, a, in an otherwise homogeneous environment. So that's driving um, some really cool patterns of coexistence at quite small scales that would help explain for the pervasive effect of mistletoe on species richness. Uh, many other interactions in, uh, with, with mistletoes, um, just whipping through them uh, visually, a lot of insects, including many specialists, uh, reliant on mistletoes. In Australia, there's a heap of butterflies. They only lay their eggs on mistletoe. The only thing their larvae eat is mistletoe. And they're pretty important controllers of mistletoe in many areas, as are brush-tailed possums. Brush-tailed possums go out of their way to eat mistletoe, preferring it over almost anything else. Um, it's widely used as a roosting site, as a nesting site, um, and it's a pretty important uh, nectar uh, resource as well, mostly for nectar feeding birds. Some insects do visit it as well. Not clear if there's any insect pollination going on that hasn't been documented, but it could occur in some of the green flowered species. Now you can have too much of a good thing. Um, when I see a tree like that driving on the roadside, it's like, oh, you poor bugger. Uh, that's not good. That's like having 15 teenage sons that just won't leave. You know, your budget can only stretch so far. Same with, same with that tree. That to me says something's out of whack. If you look at the growth of that tree, many of you in this audience will have looked at many trees. That tree grew up in company, okay? A company is all gone and it's the one thing there. So potentially there's gonna be increased seed rain. More, more birds are gonna land and defecate in that tree. The two most important things constraining mistletoe in Southern Australia, brush-tailed possums and fire. Mistletoe has no defences against fire at all. Here's one I prepared earlier. This is a mistletoe. This species of mistletoe, box mistletoe. My hand is holding the mistletoe. That's the host, a yellow box. There are no roots. There's no storage organs at all. So if a low level fire comes through, crisps up the foliage, they don't re-sprout. They don't, they don't have a, a little secret hollow log of, of carbohydrates they can draw on. If they can't photosynthesize, if they can't make sugars, they're dead donkeys. So the occasional fire, lots of hungry mouths, both possums dependent on hollows. Oh yeah, cut down all the hollow bearing trees. Butterflies dependent on nectar bearing shrubs in the other story. Oh bugger, the sheep ate all of them. Well, no bloody wonder you've got so many mistletoes. So those are a few things landholders can do to tweak to get those controlling mechanisms back in. Go ahead, cut them off. Get an arborist in, she can do the hard work, remove all of them from the canopy, um, but you're not dealing with the underlying uh, mechanisms, just the, just the symptoms. It will continue coming back until you embrace um, more of those ecolo ecological interactions that are driving uh, that pattern that you're seeing. Um, that's not really relevant here. Just, to, just, just noting that when I'm talking to people about this, language really matters. Um, and when I'm talking about coarse woody debris, the person I'm talking to often thinks about, oh, you mean that shit that harbors the pests, where all the bunnies end up, where the foxes have their dens. It's like, well, maybe. Um, and, you know, what I think of as a habitat rich, you know, uh, property, uh, my neighbors uh, would label as, as messy. Uh, so messaging, messaging really matters in this space. And I'm sure many of you have dealt with these, you know, tricky concepts and several ways to, 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 to explain them. So choose your handle uh, carefully. Now, I'm not saying that mistletoe is the be all and end all for insects and litter and declining woodland birds. It's one, it's one important litter source of many. And the others are not eucalypts. Eucalypts are, are pretty lousy when it comes to generating litter. Uh, they don't generate much of it and it's really recalcitrant. It takes a lot of convincing to decompose. Whereas acacias, casuarinas, 
and some of those root parasitic shrubs in the Santalaceae, the Exocarpus, you know, Quandongs, those things are worth their weight in pickled onions. They churn through a lot of litter and they're constantly topping up uh, the stores of that brown food web that really underpins a lot of what we see when we walk around a woodland. Want to touch on uh, the flip side of things. What do you do when there's no mistletoe in an area? Here's a scene that will be fam familiar to many of you Melbourneites, a lovely leafy <coughs> plane tree, uh, Melbourne streetscape. And Tim Flannery uh, has opinions uh, and he has opinions about plane trees. He's got a standing bet at his local pub that if anybody brings in a plane tree with evidence that an insect had taken a bite out of it, he'd shout the whole bar. In his considered view, plant trees are about as useful as, as if they were made of concrete. Now, Melbourne City Council uh, took, took on that challenge and said, rightio then, uh, Tim, we've got a lot of plant trees. We need to remove a few of them to do some upgrades, to put in some stations and move some roads around. What can we do to the remaining trees to make them more valuable for wildlife? We know about hollows. We know about chainsaw carved hollows and nest boxes. Can we add mistletoes to the canopy? Uh, so there's some of the hollows. I've got a colleague uh, um, who developed a cool plastic one. So we're in this space as well. Um, but mistletoes are part of the mix. Now, the minute you're talking about it in an urban landscape, safety comes first. And mistletoes might affect branch fall. Data is oh, unconvincing. Um, so if a mistletoe affects a tree, you want to make sure that you're not increasing the, the, the risk of a, of a branch falling onto somebody, their car, their house, whatever it is. But this is a mistletoe that doesn't do that. Uh, that's an ancient lineage of mistletoes endemic to Australia, the genus Mulerina. Started off as coniferous mistletoes, are now switched to angiosperms, um, and they infect the trunk, not branches. They scramble. They've got multiple ramifying haustoria. They can actively move as they grow. Uh, these are all the mistletoe here, these epicortical roots. Cool. Uh, so we, uh, we planted a bunch of seeds. Um, and uh, so these are all the plane trees in, in there's a lot in, in the downtown area. And we planted a bunch of seeds and put some signage up. And we, we had a lot of comms. We were on the, on the front foot waiting for, how dare you, parasites, oh my gosh. Uh, and we got the exact opposite. So Melbourne, obviously very informed, um, you know, group of people. Um, it's like, great. This is awesome. Can we get some signs on them? Because we want to see them. We want to keep keep eye, keep 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 tabs on butterflies. And I'll, I'll, I'm in um, I'm in Frankston. Can you can you do it there as well? So people really got behind this, and I think uh, as a restoration tool, worth considering. Worth considering uh, in many in many settings, including some pretty you know heavily modified urban urban forests. Um, so our vision for Melbourne, glorious city to begin with, and a mistletoe bird. And it's, yeah, so much better than Sydney. Uh, a little bit about microclimate. This is an emerging area. I'm working with a few people, Anne Griebel in particular, at University of uh, Technology, at, at um, University of Western Sydney. Uh, mistletoes and other parasitic plants are lush. They're, the guard cells around their stomata aren't really functional. They don't close. They're always transpiring. When it gets stinking hot and very dry, they are shedding vast amounts of water. That's one of the main reasons why large infections can have effects on host vigor. It's from water loss. That affects um, microclimate, both of the individual uh, within the canopy, uh, but also the entire tree. Birds have worked this out. If you want to find an owl on a, on a, on a plus 40 degree day, you go to a big chunk of mistletoes and you'll often find owls or koalas just hunkering down. It's about 15 degrees cooler there than it is over, over, over here. Um, so we're working in this space now, doing some fun stuff with thermal imaging. Uh, and this is not just a mistletoe thing. We're finding very similar effects with Kwandong uh, and sandalwood in the, in the Western deserts. You can grow your own. I'm conscious of time here because I do want to hear some questions. Um, just understand you can grow your own. It's actually quite easy to do. There's a few a few things to pay attention to. Local seed has to be ripe. So like an avocado, give it a squidge. If it's hard, come back later. Underside of the, of the twig, living twig of a tree that you've seen it growing on. Doesn't need to be a native. Exotics are fine. Plum trees are good hosts on the underside. So it sticks and then when, when there's dew, it rehydrates the viscum and it gives it a water source. Final bit, 
it needs to be in a well-lit area. Mistletoe seeds are photosynthetically active. If they're in the dark, they won't be able to make their own juice to power penetration. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.